Hello, folks. Welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you are doing well. Uh, how are you? I hope you're having a, a good summer. Uh, we're in August now, uh, which is cra- crazy, crazy to think. Um, still have a, a lot of travel on my calendar for uh, the upcoming uh, weeks and, and months and so. Uh, so looking forward to that. Also looking forward to uh, just kind of soaking in the last of my uh, my summer concert season. Uh, so that's where my mind's at. And uh, as I'm sure you know, if you listened to last week's episode, uh, particularly heated uh, about recent revelations about uh, a former podcast guest, you can go ahead and, uh, and listen to that. But uh, I am uh, running myself and something I, I am thinking about a lot is uh, for continuously trying to move forward, not unlike uh, like a shark tries to continuously move forward. Uh, uh, that is what I am attempting to do because that to me is my the new path with which uh, I achieve uh, stasis and like uh, peace of mind is to to not dwell. I, I can't remember where I read this, but I remember reading somewhere that, uh, depression is 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 like living in the past, a symptom of living in the past, and anxiety is a symptom of living too far in the future. Uh, so lots of people talk about like living in the the moment and the the now. And I've I've heard this new phrase uh, as like a late thirties, uh, being in my as a late thirties guy trying to catch up with what the uh, the new vernacular is, such as you know cap and riz. Uh, vague understanding of of what those of what those are um and uh you know girl dinner that was a, a fun one uh following the the barbie discourse and uh deciding that there's just a lot of people that really need to get something that they enjoy in their lives so that they don't uh freak out about things that don't matter too much like movies and Ultimately, uh, oh, and my my other favorite favorite uh, phrase, and maybe this sort of living in the moment sort of feeling is uh, is that is a uh, is soft life where you just live a life of uh, just uh, basically an unhurried, low pressure kind of lifestyle, uh, a direct opposition to a uh, hustle culture, which I feel like has grown into a level of uh, to unhealthy levels. Um, and I certainly so, and and I, as an ambitious person, and also one who creates entertainment, wants to get what more well known. Uh, I'm caught up in the dichotomy between the soft life and the hustle, uh, whereas I like to combine it everything into uh, the soft hustle. Whereas I do a lot of things, but I also make a lot of time for doing nothing. And the simple pleasure of eating a, a home cooked meal with my wife. And watching a show that means uh, nothing and is pointless, and then uh, time with friends while continuously trying to to make this pot while making this podcast and plotting my return my my plotting my my path through uh, through comedy. I will say uh, real quick since we're talking about comedy, and this also, uh, as you know, I love my segues into uh, our get the guest today. My my guest on the show today is um. Chris Griggs. Chris uh, Griggs is a stand-up comic, uh, improv actor, uh, teaches at the People's Improv Theater, which, as I'm sure you folks know, is one of my home bases. Uh, if you uh, are listening to this uh, the day it comes out, which is August 7th, uh, my sketch comedy group, Backdoor Barbecue, that I am the tech for, is going to be doing two shows at the People's Improv Theater in Manhattan, uh, August 10th, 7 p.m., and August 12th at 9 p.m. I'll have ticket links in the description, as well as links um, to my guest today. Uh, Chris, I met, well, I actually met Chris a long time ago when I was the doorman at the People's Improv Theater. Uh, no, no, not the People's Improv Theater. That's what I was just talking about. Uh, when I was the doorman at the Laughing Devil Comedy Club in Long Island City, a narrow, uh, almost railroad-style uh, comedy club sat about 50 people. It was part of my uh, era of uh, like being uh, new to the city, trying to ingratiate myself into the world of New York City comedy. And one of the ways that w- it was thought of at the time was you sort of like make yourself helpful and available to uh, p- 
people who have like a room or bookers or owners. So that was part of part of me trying to do that. And also because I really needed uh, the eight dollars an hour for the two nights of work when I was stringing together temp job after temp job. Uh, I th- I met Chris when he was coming in to to do spots at shows, and I met Chris years later when I was asked uh, to tech a show of his at the pit. Very cool, interesting improv show revolved around dreams and the concept of dreaming. And Chris and I got to chat. I had a really fascinating conversation about uh, the not only sort of like the behind the scenes kind of nitty gritty dynamics that come with trying to break into the art scene of a large city, but also the kind of ever-evolving experimental nature of playing with the forms that, that come from being in this, uh, being in the city and doing art for a long time. You have your things to love, and then you also find, have your ideas for changing things up. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, links to everything Chris does, uh, is in the description as well. And you can also take classes with Chris at the People's Improv Theater. Uh, He teaches uh, improv and he teaches stand-up as well. So make sure that you, uh, if you're looking to get into comedy, I think the pit's a great place to do it. Uh, I've evolved on my feeling about uh, comedy classes. I used to be very uh, strictly against it. Uh, And now I'm coming around to their value as a guy trying to be less of a a grumpy... uh, just kind of a, I guess more just not trying to be a grump in general. I mean, I am wearing all black. I am dressed like I play in a, in a metal core band right now, but that's where I'm at. And this conversation is uh, a lot of that and a lot of uh, thoughtful information. And uh, if you are like me and on the grind in New York City and on that soft grind, as I like to say, uh, then I feel like there's a lot uh, of interesting information for you here. So uh, let's get into it and I'll check, check, to uh, check in with you guys at the end and uh but let's talk to chris griggs so so before we got on here we're talking a little bit about like the the passing process and and especially i feel like the club passing process in new york city is such a frustrating enigma to a lot of comics so you were telling me about um so i get i guess adam sank comic in new york uh was i guess was he maybe maybe not the booker but he was like the watching the the audition gatekeeper for sure because i had to uh i'd known steve hofstetter for a while and that was the owner of the club and adam was the one that actually came to my sets and I think if Adam liked my sets, then he would give me the go-ahead with Steve. And I, I believe, if I recall, I, I had to go in twice mm-hmm. and audition. And he, uh, he turned me over to Steve as someone that should pass the club. And, and Steve didn't even uh, want to, he didn't look at me again. So honestly, it's one of the few times, I've been doing stand-up for about 16 years. I'd say it's one of the few times that I felt that that was, oh, that was a process. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't bring anybody. I didn't do anything. I just came to the club, did a set. There was feedback, came back, and I got passed. And then I kept doing the club, and then eventually I got passed to, to, for a paying spot. So I loved that club. I thought it was great. You could get right there off the, off the uh, subway. It, the crowd, the way the, the way the room was set up, um, it was a little bit challenging because it was narrow, but I always felt it was very intimate. Yeah, and the food was fantastic, and it gave me a reason to kind of go in that area because that was a that was a sweet little spot. I mean, they had some really cool restaurants, some really cool bars, and and you worked there, and we've I'd forgotten about that, and now we're back. Exactly, we've come full. Uh, I've had many full circle moments in my comedy life uh, on this podcast, Chris. Yeah. So what I loved about the Laughing Devil. Um, I don't know if you ever worked there when the stage, the stage used to be at the very end of the room next to the bathroom. And I it was created there for both at the end and in the middle. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it created this really long sort of uh, almost like train car situation. So like you could play to like the first couple of tables, but towards the back, it was really hard to be involved. So I really liked, I can't remember who had the idea, but when it happened, I remember really being excited about, putting the stage in the middle so you could kind of like 
kind of rotate and pan around. Um, yeah. You were a lot closer to the 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 full crowd that way. Um, that room was that particular room. I spent a lot of time in, and it's like real, like from the beginning all the way up and almost through till the end. I I, I tapped out after a while because I just had a little bit of PTSD from one of Rich Voss's hecklers uh, trying to trying to punch me in the face. <laughs> uh, not even like performing just like one during one of my like door guy shifts um so to, to that process and i'm not sure what your experience has been like with other stand-up clubs in the city especially but sometimes like like I, i've spent like hours and hours talking to comics about oh well how does this club work how how do you get in here and it it rarely, if ever, like Laughing Devil was one of the few places where I felt like it was email, email, you can get an audition set, you will be told yes or no, and then you could try again if you if you got a no. It seems like, so, uh, some of the decisions uh, sometimes when it comes to like who gets passed or not getting passed, there, there's never really a ton of information as to why. Because I knew tons of funny comics who I think should be passed at places, and they aren't. So what was your experience in other clubs in the city? Um, I think, you know, I was thinking about this coming out of the pandemic because I kind of think the, the process before the pandemic and after, and I say process with air quotes because, you know, I don't know how much process, and every club is going to have a different process or in air quotes. Uh -huh. So I don't really know. They're all going to be different, but I think it's changed. I think. Uh, I was trying to figure this out. I feel like I've been passed in some capacity at some point in time over my 16 years, uh, almost everywhere except for the seller. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in some places it might be just for guest spots or maybe in one club it was for check spots or something like that or late night. And um, I, I don't, I never, there wasn't really, uh, the process was always kind of a velvet rope thing where you know, people are in power and whatever it is that you're in power of has to be the most important thing in the universe. And, and people act accordingly. And the, um, mo most of them, I don't know, bringer shows, you know, I remember doing a bringer show and I got passed somewhere. I remember I did the lottery thing for the comic strip. Comic strip. Yeah. I stood, I did that one. And, uh, what was funny, it was, man, this is really going back in the day, but I remember, um, you know, they put you back then and it was a really difficult slot. Like it was late night and the person that was emceeing the shows kind of did everything they could to kill the room. Uh -huh. So they were sort of doing everything they could to kill the room. And I just remember that because the first time I auditioned, um, the, the crowd was dead and the person who was hosting was also the person that was the gatekeeper to the, the, the primary booker. Uh -huh. You had to get through them to get to the primary booker and they, but yeah, between them and the audition comics, they pretty much killed the room. And Jessica Kirsan came by to drop in, to do a spot right before me. And I, you know, the heavens opened up and I was like, Oh, like the gods had, the comedy gods had just thrown me a solid, and she did what she does. She went in there and she crushed. Just annihilated. Yeah, annihilated and got the room back. And then the person that was hosting, who was also the person deciding if I was going to go to the next level, they killed the room again. And they didn't even kill it with jokes. They killed it with, okay, settle down. All right. Okay. Look, we've got more auditioners. We have more people that are auditioning for the club. She oh, kept calling, you know, everything was like belittling us, no credits, no, no enthusiasm. It was, everything was meant to kill the room again. And not even by doing jokes that they wouldn't laugh at. She, they literally just let 10 minutes go by. Right. Until the room settled down into, uh, and then it's like, okay, are you ready now for another auditioner? It's like that. And uh -huh. so I did, I did have a set. I had a good set. I thought, um, I think that they were, I think they were somewhat surprised. The set went better than they thought and <laughs> I didn't pass. And then I did the lottery again a year later with someone else and I passed for late night 
And, uh, but even that, honestly, if I was really looking at my audition, like the person, I'm not even making this up. The person that auditioned before me bombed so bad that the last words they said were, I'll see you next year. <laughs> well, at least they were so self-aware. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so I came in and I had, I think I had a really, really good strong set, especially considering everything. But you could tell, I even impressed, even the person who passed me said, I usually don't like, because I do a lot of religion in my act. And they said, like, I don't really like religion, but you really made me laugh and I liked it. So I'm going to pass you. And I really, honest to God, thought they're just going to pass me even if it was just for guest spots or whatever, but it was for late night. So I think most of the time, there's always an asterisk, there's always a thing, there's always another Easter egg, always a something. Unless you've got, you know, industry heat, or unless you've got the right connection, or unless something is right. going on. I think it's always been difficult to get in clubs. And I, they're not necessarily in the business of always looking for new people. They're, you know, so I don't know, it's always been a little difficult. And I think what's happened probably over 16 years since when I started is that um, people are taking their careers in their own hands more so than ever before. So then the question mm -hmm. becomes, does it matter? You know, so like if you don't, sure. if you're not in a certain place on a Monday night doing five minutes, does it really matter? And there are places definitely that it does matter. There are certainly clubs that it matters, but there's a lot that I don't know if it matters that much. So Yeah. Yeah, I I know what you mean. I did three of those comic strip auditions. I did uh, the one where they used to have like a panel of regulars uh, insult you after your after your set. Uh, yeah, I never had that one. Thank God. Yeah, that that one I have like some serious like blood feud level with with the comics on that panel because they like really just tore in. Not even my act, just like basic like physical appearance and like character st stuff. Um, and so that I have like some serious, serious issues. I want to air, uh, I want to air with them if I ever get the chance. Um, and then this, <laughs> and then the second one was the second one was just like a, a more regular, the manager was like, uh, we're going to, it's no this time. And then the third time, uh, and then the third time was a, a yes for a late night. But to, to your point, uh, as much as comics love to complain about social media and whatever new thing comes out. There is that seems to be the tool by which some some folk some folks are lucky enough to kind of get around that sort of arbitrary uh, nonsense of these these little fiefdoms that uh, the that owners have. Um, well, so, if I were going back to younger me, I would just I would think more about monetization of what your value is and thinking about because in some ways, you know, if I'm getting an audition because I'm bringing people to your club, I'm bringing you money. If right. I have, you know, a podcast that has half a million followers, I'm potentially bringing you money. So I think I, I was naive. And also, in fairness to me, I think when I first started, basically no one really talked to you for five or anywhere from five to ten years anyway. And you don't come back right. to me until you're bulletproof. And so I never had any illusions of anything. Like I was my first few years, I just barked in Times Square. I barked the cabaret room. I had no illusions of doing anything. As a matter of fact, I remember I passed one my, it wasn't my, I think it was the third club I passed. The owner of the club said, how come I've never heard of you? And I said, because I've been avoiding you for three and a half years. <laughs> so I avoided them until it was a mathematical certainty. But I've also had, you know, I mean, sometimes it's random. I mean, I had really good experiences. Um, the first club I ever passed was the Boston Comedy Club, which isn't hasn't been around forever. Uh huh. And yeah, that's a legendary. It was place. a wonderful manager that just liked my stuff, you know. And mm -hmm. I'd done shows there, and they liked me, and they passed me. And then, of course, that's also the problem with going through these cycles with some places is that then they either left or were let go. I don't know, but they weren't there anymore. And then you have to start all over again. And the new regime wasn't having it, so. Then the but then that person went to stand up New York, and then that person passed me at stand up New York, mm -hmm. and then it's strange. Then that same person came over later, years, a couple of years later, they took over that job again. The person that had passed me also left then, and they didn't use me again. And then as the circle comes around, they had eventually uh, were looking for work, and they needed me. They were trying to get through me as a gatekeeper. So 
they had to come and basically, I don't know, I didn't ask for an apology. I just wanted to see how they would handle it. But they sort of had to apologize. And because the way they handled it was not professional. I mean, Mm -hmm. I will say that. So it wasn't like they didn't use me. It was sort of like I was I was supposed to be doing a spot, a paid spot, and they they took me off the show. (laughs) <laughs> and because they weren't the ones that booked me and then they never gave me a look or any feedback after that so mm-hmm. i feel like it was more about the fact that they never you know i weren't i wasn't their person so then later on they needed me for something and i have that happen you know i think it's weird in a way i'm always surprised how people handle power especially these days because <clears throat> you know it used to be that there were only like 3 or 4 or 5 ways to get to something and now there might be 500 ways to get to something. Right. And everyone that represents one 500th of that way acts like they're the most important person in the universe. And so everyone's running around. I have a, I mean, a buddy of mine, I have a saying like, everyone's the king and queen of Tiny Island. So everyone's running around like that. But eventually, you know, talented people are going to cross talented people. And so mm-hmm. you're, there's a lot of people. There's a, and you know, and like, you there are certain situations in new york where people might wish that they had been respectful to me you know and Mm -hmm. that's it's always interesting when those things come around but i will say you know i have a lot of bad qualities like everybody but um i don't i don't stick it to people so Mm -hmm. like if if someone has done something to me that was unfair and they were actually qualified for something that they were asking me to help them with, I would help them. So uh, I wouldn't vouch for them necessarily, but I might help them. You know, it just depends on what it is. I mean, one time someone was asking me for something and it was a weird conversation because I was like, technically, I know you're qualified for what you're asking me for, but you're also, you do a lot of drugs. So I don't know, I don't know who I'm dealing with, you know, on that thing. So I don't know. But yeah, the, I've had plenty of people that were really supportive of me, and I feel lucky that they've kind of been in my corner all the time. And then I've had people like, you know, when you and I were talking with The Laughing Devil, where I just engaged with a comic, not very much at all, but I, that person's always got a, you know, I've always got a spot for them because they were nothing but professional with my process. 100%. I did, I, I always remembered like how every comic that I, I, I interacted with at that club, like treated me just as the door. So how did I treat you? You can be honest. Cause I don't even remember the whole you were thing. Very was, nice. I, was I a dick? Huh? You were, you were very nice. I think I just, I think I just said, hi, Chris, I'm well. And you're like, Oh, hi, nice to meet you. And then I said, I probably said, Oh, okay, here's, here's like 20 bucks or whatever. That probably would have been the extent. And then the rest would have just been me like, in between like handing out exit passes, like trying to catch a couple sets because I was there because I uh, I didn't blow it. Yeah. Well, and I, and I remember all these years later, especially, I remember, especially back then I was kind of like the guy I I would always sort of act like the guy. It was his first couple of weeks in prison. I would just keep my head down and not make eye contact and just try Uh to do my job and do well. And I didn't, you know, I'd have a drink, but I wouldn't get crazy because I knew, you know, there, people are looking for reasons not to use you over reasons to use you. So I definitely back then was more, I'm always a little bit like that unless I'm completely comfortable in the space I'm working. I generally just keep a low profile and try to do my job. Yeah, I think that's the best advice when it comes to uh, to a creative career, for sure. The other thing that I've come around to a lot lately, and this is, I think, kind of wisdom that just comes from being here, is that uh, enjoyment of the thing has to be n- number one. That has to be the most important thing. Otherwise, that's uh, why why even do any of this? And then the other thing I think of is that uh, I think a lot of me and uh, my peers when we were younger thought, okay, if we can become like national headlining comedians, then all of our then all, all of our brain problems will be fixed. We'll, we'll be happy then. But well, then now you know enough comedians to know that's not true. Some of the most miserable people I know are successful stand-ups. Right. And, and I'm just... Or actors, in fairness to stand-ups, or actors, or just people that are very successful, but they're not necessarily happy. Right. And, and I think that comes from, like, you know, putting, like, success is... Ne- like, monetary success is never going to 
fix some deep rooted issues. Um, so I've gotten to that place where I still enjoy the thing. And I view that as, as one of my victories, uh, my continuing victories. Um, so 16 years as a stand-up, uh, were you a stand-up comic first uh, or were you an improviser first? Which came, uh, what did you I, start in? I came to New York 20 years ago-ish and I was a writer and a brand person at an advertising. So um, I, and, and when I, I, probably as soon as my plane landed, there was a Second City Theater that they actually had a Second City program in New York, which is now oh. so weird because they, you know, they had it for a couple of years. I went through the program, then Chicago shut it down. And then now here we are. And they're going to open up a new there's a new Second City program opening up, which is kind of <laughs> crazy. It's amazing how our lives repeat, Chris. It really it is. So, yes. Yeah, so I, I was obsessed with um I, Robin Williams, and I knew that he liked uh, Jonathan Winters, and Jonathan Winters was a big improv guy, and I was yeah. really fascinated by that. And I knew that most of a lot of the Second City uh, alumni, a lot of them got on SNL um, in the early days, especially. So I was like, whatever they're doing, I was fascinated by it. So I jumped in a program immediately. I went through all the program levels and. I auditioned and got in a Second City Review Showcase, so it was kind of improv to sketch review like they do in Chicago. Okay. <laughs> and I loved it. I thought it was great. And I don't remember. I, I used to live on 77th Street, and I used to walk by Stand Up New York all the time, and I just felt like it was mocking me. Like, man, why don't <laughs> I have the guts to do that? Uh-huh. And I had been doing improv for a few years, and, um, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I was kind of around, um, yeah, 9-11 had kind of started to change my brain chemistry a little bit when that had happened. And like, you start mm -hmm. thinking about things like, you know, do you really want to keep doing what you're doing the rest of your life? And, you know, yeah. all that, I think all of us kind of went through some version of that. And I kind of had kind of my, I think my brain chemistry had altered to the point to where I wanted, I, I kind of remember I used to say to myself back then, at the very worst case, uh, I'll be the fun guy in the old folks home. So yeah. like New York won't, and I think this kind of goes back to what you're talking about, like New York won't promise you certain kinds of success, but what it will do is if you love something, it'll get you around people that are really good at it. So yes. if you love candle making, there's some crazy high level candle making people around New York, whereas a lot of places in the country, you know, if you liked uh, stand up comedy, that's cool, but who cares? I mean, there's maybe three people in town that do it and they're probably not that great, you know? So sure. that's cool. But New York, you know, people are doing it. So at some point I, I melted down and I took a class at Stand Up New York from a wonderful person and a wonderful comedian named Mary Domino. And mm -hmm. she was wonderful and it was great. And then I just kind of got the bug and then I did it. Um, and I just, I kind of, there was, I saw Jay Leno on inside the actor studio and he kind of had this formula for like four times a week in front of strangers for four years and you graduate comedy college or something like that. And so there was a guy who, um, he had barkers for, um, a cabaret room and, and I talked to him, like, I didn't care about getting paid. I just wanted to know that. Some nights I might bring in 10 people. Some nights I might not bring in anybody, but I just wanted, he did two shows, two shows on Friday, I think two shows on Saturday. Um, and maybe he did one on Sunday. I don't know. But I was just trying to get, I wanted to cover those spots. So those were my four spots. And then everything else could be, you know, I would do an open mic or two a week. Because I also looked at open mics as necessary, but you had to find balance because it can yeah. hurt you more than it can help you. Totally. And I had been doing improv. I went through Second City and I went through Upright Citizens Brigade. And uh, I don't know if I had started at the pit yet, but I definitely, I had enough, I was around enough people that I could sway myself into, oh, you're doing a sketch comedy show in a yoga studio. I'd love to do five and host. So I was really big on I feel like everybody was begging for spots all the time. So a lot of times my entree would just be, can I open your show and host and bring you up if I promise I'll only do two minutes of material or anything that just sounded like low risk, you know? Yeah. So that was kind of my move. 
Yeah, that's not that's a, a pretty good idea. Like the kind of proposition that would make someone go, eh, why eh, why not?" Um Right. To- totally. And your end to to open mics, I feel like there's definitely a point where you uh start um falling back down down the hill. Uh they're good for an amount of time like as far as like getting your sea legs and like really yeah. like your foundations as a as a performer, but I do think uh, after a while you do, it is helpful to start working smarter rather than just grind, hustle, kind of culture it. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, always when you've done something for a while, there's always that temptation, like it was better in my day and back in my day we did this. One thing that I do think the young comics, um, I, I, I like that they're kind of creating their own manifest destiny and that they're trying to build their own boat and they're they're trying not to be quite as beholding you know i think like everything there's always a little bit of good with bad i think that they may not sweat the actual craft of being great as much as i tried to (laughs) because all i did was think about i got to be great at this because no one would ever consider me a real comedian stand up if i couldn't perform anywhere so now you know things are getting a little more niche which is fine things change you know and that's fine but i do i do kind of respect the fact that uh, the hustle. I respect the hustle. I, I, I don't, I've always worked hard. I would go back and talk to younger me about maybe working a little more smart. Mm-hmm. I was, I, w- I will say, and, and I, I also, there's a real sort of like, I, I used to kind of be a more of a, a hipster about like uh, what I liked in, in stand up. And I've kind of let a lot, some of that go and have started to really kind of not envy, but appreciate uh comics who can do a vi- an act that has a lot of appeal like a gabriel iglesias or like kevin james or even and this is kind of a funny story i i saw jay leno live in la uh, a few weeks ago oh uh he still does those like sundays at the comedy and magic club in hermosa beach right and and i i was like hey do you want to see jay i told my wife I was like hey do you want to see jay leno and she's like yeah uh, we were the youngest people there by choice by like a lot. Um, but he killed, uh, he, he, you can He's a he, professionals professional, you know? Yeah. And people forget, you know, that Leno, before he took over the tonight show, he was top of the food chain and not because he was ubiquitous. You know, I mean, a lot of times with the tonight show, you have to sort of, uh, appeal to the masses at that point. Right. But just as a stand up. There, Jay Leno didn't cut corners in the slightest. He was a great comic, and he was edgy and really, really, uh, he, he understood the craft. He really knew what he was doing, and he still does. I'm not mm-hmm. trying to say that, but it's just more that I think now people kind of look at him as uh, kind of an all-around persona, and you forget that, you know, it's like Ellen DeGeneres. We look at her as, again, someone that's sort of uh, mainstream, mainstream, mm-hmm. but Ellen DeGeneres, you know, her, her conversations with God, uh, set for the tonight show and her, that's an edgy bit of art. I mean, that's a very, very, uh, amazing piece. That's a great set. Great set. Yeah. Yeah. You know, totally. I rem- I remember that set. It's been, I might have to go back and re rewatch that, but, and, and then also to your point with, with Leno, like he was just joke after joke after joke. He like went up and he must've done like easily 90, like almost over not over 90 minutes and he he had he ended on on a couple of things that are were a little more familiar but he still had like current stuff he was telling personal stuff he was he was not shying away from the fact that he's like a rich celebrity so his like stories like oh going to the dry cleaners with my wife as jay Le- as jay leno and like just boom 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 like uh <laughs> like he's still he's not resting on his laurels because i had always heard that from 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 comics who I guess re- would remember because his stand up days were before my time, but people always talk about him as like the best stand up of like the seventies. That sort of like heyday of I, that's the fair. yeah, the, that sort of like and maybe even this this would probably even have predated the comedy boom a little bit. Um, him as like a really powerhouse stand up, and you know, and he doesn't put his stuff online. So I, I was just listening to a podcast with Leno a few about a month ago. And I struggle with this, you know, I struggle with, can I have a better option than putting all my material online or doing bad crowd work? Is there another option <sighs> for me? Uh, but, you know, and I get it, you know, cause Leno just likes, Leno, he's an old school, like he just likes to get on stage and kill. 
And so why would I, you know, everyone's going to Google his act and they're going to know his stuff. And why would he, why would he want to do that? And I'm certainly not that, but I do struggle with that as well. It's sort of, well, I mean, I could put some of my stuff online, but I'm, I don't want to put my best stuff. And then that doesn't make me feel good because then people get a wrong representation of me as a comedian. Um, so I don't know. I think we're all trying to navigate it. It's also, but for me, it's also just my own dumbness because I've done improv and sketch so long, I could just do nothing but do funny characters and do that and be fine. Like, I don't even have to put stand up. I could put great content up just, but it's also that thing of, uh, you know, because it'd be one thing if I could just film it and edit it, but then, oh, oh, there's got to be captions. Oh, it's got to be this. And I feel like every time I sort of catch up, there's another thing I'm going to have to go and figure out. And, uh, but I'm, I'm getting better. I've been posting a few things online, throw a few character bits up and cool. all that. My engagement levels are pretty good. Like the people that follow me, we have good engagement, but I just need to find more. I got to find a, build a bridge, the middle ground between what's going on now and what I, what I want to do. No, I'm, I'm working on that same thing. If you figure something out, let me know, because to, you're right. Stand up is one of those really interesting things where unlike bands where you, you really want someone to know your songs, so they can go and see see you and they can sing along. Stand-up is interesting in that you have to be entertaining enough in all of the ways you can be entertaining and funny that isn't your actual stand-up act so that people will pay money to see the stand-up act or the the improv show. It's really kind of it's it's kind of kind of kind of crazy. Uh I've taken to all of that other stuff. I I like thinking about it as uh as as a version of creative work and yeah the the you the ubiquity of crowd work clips uh is, is kind of not not my personal favorite because i don't like doing crown work i just like everyone to just listen to me all the time and what and what i have to say uh for for while i'm on stage so i guess the only thing what i used to try to do and i i, I could probably refocus on that is i just try to write a lot just write 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 so that by the time it's time to put out a really good bit of material i have a lot of new stuff to that i can work with now takes a lot of that that, that, that takes a lot of work though <laughs> yeah i mean i've got a lot of uh i've got a lot of material so i could yeah i i don't know i think if i just had someone to it's, I'm, yeah, we're all, I mean, we're all damaged. That's why we do stand up. I mean, for me, it's strange. <laughs> like if you told me, if you said, Hey, Chris, I've got to do a talking head show in two days. Will you help me write 50 jokes? I would just write 50 jokes. But if I'm doing it for me, I'm just kind of like, wobble doo -ba -doo -ba. you know, I just wobble around and I don't know. I just yeah. don't, I don't know what it is. I procrastinate on my own stuff. You know, I've got, I could have done it. I, I've easily had an hour for years that I could do. Mm -hmm. But then I start, you know, like I, it's funny. Um, I, I shot an hour about six years ago and it looked great. And I had a, there was a distribution label that's like, yeah, we'll do it like an indie label. Mm -hmm. And then I wound up sending it to a few people like cold call few people that actually represented what I thought were my favorite comics and people like that. I just wanted to see. And I, I was weirdly, cause you know, we were talking about the laughing devil. I was weirdly uh, in LA doing uh, Steve Hofstetter had a comedy festival going on and I was uh -huh. in LA. I think it was called the La La festival. And I was in there, I was there, had a great time. And one of those people called me back and they said, uh, this is a good news, bad news thing. Uh, the good news is I don't respond to cold solicitations of people that send me their set, but your set is so good that I feel like I wanted to respond. And then I'm thinking, cool. And then the bad news was, and I don't think younger comics might not even really understand this as being bad news. He said, the bad news is I think you've got a great set in you. And I knew what he was talking about because uh -huh. it's the worst thing he could have said to me. Because when I started, the idea was most stand-up comedians have really one great set in them. And that was mm -hmm. kind of the prevailing knowledge. And even people like Chris Rock, they would spend a few years, you know, 
before they would do another set. And now people are banging out sets every year, 18 months. Like, I just watched Tom Segura's set on it on Netflix. And uh-huh, his newest was, one? Huh? His newest yeah, one? Yeah, his newest one. And I was watching it because I've watched, I've watched some of his stuff. And you know how you have those internal dialogues with your brain? And I'm like, I, I think that's his best set, which seems weird because he's put out quite a few sets. I think that was his best set. I thought it was great. And then I started um, looking at his interviews, and he said that, oh, he thinks it's his best set because he, between the pandemic and all the stuff, he had three years to work on it. So you think uh, a work ethic, a Tom Segura banging, you know, doing it all the time, for him, I can't get up as much as he can. So yeah. what is that? What's the time? What is that for me? Well, if his is three years, it might, for me, it might be five, six years. So that's always the fascinating bit of math is that, you know, Bill, I think, I think I saw Bill Burr or something. He said he used to do stand up specials and now he does commercials for himself. Uh-huh. And it's because you can only do so much in that allotted amount of time. You can put together a professional hour. But are you really going to, you know, like, you know, we, everybody's kind of beat to death Dave Chappelle's specials. And, and I like, I, I like, I like the specials, but killing them softly is, it's amazing. That's, that's still one of his, his best. It's an amazing set. But, you know, so you have people, and that's always like in my brain, it just sticks there. It's sort of like, well, you might ultimately, wouldn't you rather just do one great set and that's your legacy rather than doing three mediocre sets and then everyone's like that's why he never made it because oh he didn't do oh those sets aren't great you know that nonsense but i don't even remember because you know we're all watching people's sets and Mm -hmm. you know they're 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 more again they're more exposure vehicles a lot of times than anything else people used to not even do crowd work in their hour specials and you see that now yeah i i remember those days as well that was one of the kind of shifts for me which uh, I, again, if you can do it and it's and it's funny and then it also comes through on the tape, then I I say leave it leave it in. If not, it's then like you that's can edit the irony it. is that I could see me putting it in because you know as as much as I mean I as much as we're kind of talking about whether like oh crowd work vehicles and things and should or should I mean I am also arrogantly I'm one of the better crowd work people I think in New York I think I'm I'm up there with whoever I uh-huh. I really believe because I've done improv for 20 years so. I yeah. I know how to I've done so many situations where you know I could improvise my way through it and um so I I respect it and really really appreciate it you know I was like a warm up comic on a comedy central show for a while so like I know how to do that stuff and I think I know how to do it at a high level it's so even I think even more so like you know it's funny we were talking about Jessica Kirsan earlier her mm-hmm. crowd work bits are his outstanding Amazing. and if you you want to go go look that up if you want to see great crowd work bits just watch what jessica does it's super funny super yeah, funny yeah jessica kirsten is like an absolute like uh battle tank of stand up like every conceivable discipline of the stand up wheel she excels at i i i saw her um there were rebecca trent did a couple shows in the like the first summer of the pandemic back in 2020 did a few shows like outdoors in a parking lot where the stage was the bed of a pickup truck and Jessica <laughs> Kirsten then like, like closed one of these sets. And my, my, I, I always also like uh, watching how my wife, who I've kind of introduced to stand up, she didn't, wasn't into stand up before she met me. Um, I like gauging her reaction and she fucking loves Jessica Kirsten. She thinks she's uh, like one of the best. Something else I wanted to ask you. Um, so coming from, so being in New York for 20 years and kind of like your improv education and your stand up education are kind of coming through at the same time. And I know that you teach, uh, improv now as well. Have you ever like worked, um, with standups teaching improv and what is something that you found, uh, is there something that standups find difficult about improv and how did you bridge that gap in a educational context? Um, I I'm, I don't know if it's I don't know I'm not into astrology but I am a Gemini so I think there's something you know people that know me know that I'm very creative but I'm also very logical mm-hmm. and there's not that's not necessarily I think a common trait I don't think with artists you know um, that's why it was kind of cool I remember I loved reading Born Standing Up um, 
The Steve Martin book? Because it's so rare to be able to read a book about an artist's journey from someone that is actually a fantastic writer and someone that actually has that skill set because these skill sets are different. So, you know, if you think about it, because also I came into acting through improv. So, you know, I've acted and I've done things here or there or like, I'm, I'm the guy that does the thing in the rom-com or I'll do the, you know, whatever, but it's all come from improvisation. And so it's also funny, like when I started doing improv, all my stand-up friends would belittle me for, you know, why are you, why are you doing improv? And now they're all doing improv because now you got to be able to do everything. You got to be able to do sketch, improv, act and all that stuff. Yep. And, you know, you don't really have time to do plays. So improv kind of helps you do that. But, um, it's very tricky, honestly, because, you know, if you think about how many improvisers I have come across through the years that have wanted to do and be a stand up mm-hmm. and how many stand ups that have tried to do improv, it's a it's a high number. It's a yeah. crazy high number. Now, if you asked me how many people do I know that can do stand up and improvisation at a professional level? it's pretty small. It's not very many people. Yeah. Yeah, My, yeah. My best example is of someone who does that is Rory Scovel. Rory Scovel was always someone who I thought works improv into his stand up sets. uh, But I just mean as a separate art form, I mean like, so you could put Mike Birbiglia in an improv show, just Uh doing improv and he's going to excel or you could put him doing stand up. But but I don't, a lot of times, as far as there are people, you know, there are, I've met a lot of comics that are outstanding at improvisational crowd work, but they've never taken, they, they don't do anything with improv. So there is kind of a different way of doing it. You know, I mean, one of, one of the best improvisers I've ever been around uh, ever is a guy named Kurt Brownholer. And Kurt Uh doesn't even do improv anymore. He kind of just quit doing improv, but he's now an amazing stand-up comedian and an amazing writer and an amazing actor. So I I guess that's kind of my point. And I think part of it is, is that, you know, um, improvisers, they don't really know how to get punched in the face over and over because they, they, you know, it's all that (laughs) group mind and it celebrates mediocrity sometimes. And like, you are a great cat. And then stand-ups, they're the fu- they they come into improv like they're the funniest ones in the room and they don't know how to say yes to anybody to save their life. So even from an improvisational standpoint, there's com- there's standups that I like, but they're coming at it from a busting the audience up standpoint. You know, they're coming at it from a negative. Whereas I've always approached crowd work from a yes and standpoint, which is a very much a improv principle. So I'm trying to. There yeah. are flaws in all people that they are okay with you celebrating. And the benefit of that approach, I think, is I don't burn the room. And the other benefit of that approach is by the time I tell someone to shut the fuck up, I'm going to get an applause break because everyone's seen me try. Everyone's seen me try to find the poet or the genius in this person in the audience. They've seen me try to find their better nature. So I feel like that that helps. Uh, But there's a lot of comedians when I was coming up that I was in awe of in terms of crowd work. I've always sort of, uh, Mike Yard is a comic in New York that I've always been in awe of just how good Mike is at doing uh, crowd work. Um, I think, uh, I hope I'm not messing up the name, but there used to be a Southern comic because, you know, you identify with Southern comics because I'm from Memphis originally. Uh, Vic Henley, he used to do a lot. What an amazing. Oh yeah, Vic, Vic's great. Uh, There's a person that, uh, I think his name was Ronald Smith. He was a, he was a warm up comic uh, for The View for so many years, and I would I remember doing shows. If I was ever on a show watching him, I was always just sit back and watch someone that just from start to finish they just really know how to make. And what I think the people, at least the people that I'm always really uh, intrigued by, are the people that it's how do we create a shared universe where it feels like this is a special night that's never going to be duplicated and they kind of know how to bring the uniqueness and the flavor of everything that's in that room into their set and it's it's so outstanding when when someone really knows how to do that because you're going to have especially in New York you have people from all walks of life and when you can pull that into a shared experience one I find I enjoy, I enjoy myself 
better because I, then it becomes my unique experience. But you have to be careful. You have to you have to be careful in New York, particularly because, I mean, I've I've been in clubs where, especially in my younger days, I remember being in clubs where I destroyed, and the booker, I they would go, hey, I want to talk to you after the show, and and this has happened to me a few times, so. <laughs> Um, where I think they're going to tell me how amazing I am, and they're like, "You don't do, don't do crowd work." And so, <laughs> you know, because they wanted they wanted people just to come in and do their sets, and they wanted the room. Because I get it. Once you really do something like that, it can be hard for someone to come in and just do a straight, you know, a twenty thirty minute set. Of yeah, the expectations of the crowd. Well, I understand, and I'm not. I'm not, that's not a knock. That was just me learning. That was some of my own learning curves. So now I just. I, I only, you know, you know what rooms you can do it in and you know what you can't. And when you get on the road, all bets are off. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. It, it, as long you, as you do well. Yeah, exactly. Like whatever it, it, it takes for sure. I remember I, cause I started in, in Balt, I started in Baltimore, which, uh, Maryland's very uniquely culturally it's Southern some places, it's, it's Northern some places, Baltimore's kind of its own unique thing. Um, and I specifically remember, remember uh, I would do sets with at the Baltimore Comedy Factory on occasion. I would open for a guy named Mickey Coachella, who used to be like the morning uh, rock radio drive time guy. So he would always get huge crowds. And the Baltimore Comedy Factory used to have $20 all-you-can-drink tickets that they would paper all over the city and over the county. So you'd get a really raucous crowd in there who are fucked up and he would just go up there and just annihilate the room and whatever it took bachelor party bachelorette's getting on stage and his clothes are coming off like all kinds of like all that all that kind of kind of shit which again something i probably would have rolled my eyes at at one point but now i sort of like just like well he's doing what had to be had to be done uh like i always Sometimes think of this you're kind just of, babysitting a room and you and to know when you have to shift into that gear, I definitely have different gears of the type of, of crowd work that I've done. And there have definitely been times where you're just like, just stick to the basics, you know, mm -hmm, totally do, do that, do that thing, talk, ask the same questions we've heard a thousand times and just do that. And then there are times when, you know, I've done crowd work where things have opened up the possibilities of like a unique experience where it's not like everybody else's thing that you're going to hear in crowd work, you know? Oh, t totally. Um, so it's kind of into that point. Um, well, a couple of the things I'd love to ask you kind of bridging these worlds again, and then also, uh, into what you're, you're doing now. Um, so at the, the pit where we, we do a lot of stuff at nowadays, you, you and I, um, there's a big placard that says "Follow the Fear" right behind the tech booth, and I look at it every day when I get up, when I when I'm there to tech stuff. What does that mean to you, and how do you try to impart uh, that into like fellow performers, pe f uh, folks you're teaching? How, what what does that kind of ethos uh, mean to you, and how do you get someone to kind of embrace that? Well, for me, I, I'm, I'm glad it's on that wall there because it's a reminder that the audience does not care if you are afraid. So it means kind of different things depending on whether it's stand-up or improv. I think as an improviser, and you, you know, if you watch people do improv shows, it's, there's a point in time where it's going to have to get weird. It's going to have to be brave. It's going to, ha you, you need to put on a show. And I think there are too many people that improvise in New York and they need to have more of a stand-up mentality of, I am here to do a great show. I mean, and technically we are here to do it with improv. Um, we are here to put on a show. We're not here just to do, you know, to just goof about. And you can do both. You can goof about and put on an amazing show. But to do that, you're going to have to push yourself past your boundaries and you're going to have to take the foot off the brake. So that's for improv. For stand-up, I, I think that's saying at least what it means to me is I'm going to have to write and perform past my own fear. You know, I've just, it's weird. I've just, in the last, it's, I've been doing it a long time, but really maybe only in the last four or five years have I really started to embrace the idea of I, I tend to sort of would craft things, anticipate 
uh, rebuke and then write around it. And then I would tweak it and do all, you know, like I just ran into a comic that knew me. We've been, we kind of came up together and uh-huh. they were like, Griggs, you're a tweaker. You're like, you're, you're the best tweaker. Cause I'm a tweaker. I tweak it. But I've lately been especially the last few years, just diving into the abyss and figuring a way I figure talent or something will help me figure out a way to write myself out of it eventually, but take the hit. So I think for yeah. stand up yeah. comedians, especially now, you know, this, you can't, you, you got to find a version not to play it safe. You got to find a version to, to pull yourself, push yourself past your limits. Cause we can all do, I'm from the South and here's a cute joke that makes you want to love me. And you know, and you can get that. It's got a little bit of diminishing returns and everything because ultimately stand up. Uh, I think it's, I'm paraphrasing an old George Carlin saying, but like stand up is a socially acceptable form of aggression. You uh-huh. have to be aggressive, but to be aggressive, you're going to push yourself past your boundaries. Sometimes and you're going to talk about things that you don't know what to do with. And I'm sometimes, especially with first year, second year comedians, they want to talk about X. And I'm thinking, you don't have the skill set to talk about X. It has nothing to do with yeah. the crowd being uptight. It has nothing to do with cancel culture or whatever it is we want to blame it on. It has everything to do with you have not become an artist to the standpoint that you can write your way and perform your way through this thing that you think you want to talk about. And then the other question is, do you want to talk about it? You yeah. know, it's, it's easy to just pick a shock topic and go through it. But what do you artistically, what do you bring into the table? Why are we talking about this? And that to me is what kind of the follow the fear side on stand up means. Because our favorite comics always are in, in the edge of uneasy. They're in, they're in that abyss of fear and like, man, I can't believe we're talking about it, but we are. And it's kind of cool. And my favorite thing, and I don't always achieve it. But my favorite thing is when I write to something that I know there are going to be people in the audience that don't want me to talk about what I'm talking about. Uh And they come up to me after the show and they say, I I don't I didn't like that, but I laughed. And I'm like, (laughs) cool, that's that's my job. So, you know, I just pointed out something that we could all agree on was funny. Yep, that's the best reaction you can get to that kind of material. It's the best kind of material is is where you can be like. You know, I don't agree with that, but that 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 was that was funny. No, ab- absolutely. My, some of my favorite laughs I've ever had have been at stuff that I don't I don't fully co- that I don't co-sign, but I I appreciate the laugh. And that's never like and just being able to have that moment and then go about my life is has been really uh, cathartic sometimes. Um I think that's kind of my favorite. Like I you know, I love um uh, I love watch Bill Burr work because Burr is somebody that everybody's laughing at, like because he's giving it to the he's giving it to the the people. Everybody's uh-huh. in their little groups, and he's like, "Yeah, he's giving it to them." And then you're laughing. Then all of a sudden, like, "Oh wait, he's giving it to me now." So he 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 gives a little he 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 pulls out his dollops to everybody. And I think that's I like those comics. You know, Wanda Sykes. I like Wanda Sykes. She's she's got a strong point of view on stage. And but she's she's gonna bust everybody up before it's over with, and I, I like that. No, so so do I, and it's fun to it's fun to get a, get a little messy. <laughs> yeah, uh, in in art, well, absolutely. And make fun of yourself. I'm always, you know, like the comedians that do long long sets, and there's not even there's not one joke at your expense. That seems weird. No, totally. Well, when I was in college, and like we were we came to like the stand up part of this comedy class that my college offered um the, the TA uh he, my my buddy Ron uh he said like okay personal personal stuff the first things i want you to write about is about you i want you to write about like you got a job you got your you got a college experience you got parents you got a sibling write it write about that so i i i love when you can sort of like start from from that place and then something else i would love to ask you before we we get out here um your show that i saw this kind of like dream improv thing um and what was the exact title of that show well it kind of changed i mean this is i I apologize for listeners (laughs) we're about to do a deep cut of a deep cut so there is an improvisation group in new york that if anybody ever told me that improv on stage wasn't great, I would say you should go see this group called Centralia. Okay. And they've been around for 20 years. And they were a huge influence on me back when Second City was around 
Um, and they do very experimental improv. So okay. the nerd in me, first I had the arrogance in the beginning to, I produced a show called uh, Centralia with Chris Griggs. And uh -huh. then I would bring them in to, to be with me on stage. And then I thought, well, I'm going to do a cover band version of this group, Centralia. And it was called the Centralia Experiment. And then I would bring in other improvisers, and then we would try to do what they do. And for people, again, that aren't familiar with them, um, they, they break all the convention. They would, they would have music. There would be spoken word. People might break into song. They would take a ton of just any kind of prop from backstage or anything they could find, and they would just throw it all over the floor. Sometimes they worked in the round. I remember once they were in minor costumes, and they had lights on their head for uh, the coal mining helmets and they would play around with light. So they do anything. They, they put on a real, real show and it's very experimental and yeah. on the cusp. And so then coming out of the pandemic, I thought, well, why don't I stop borrowing equity from something? <laughs> and I, why don't I just create my own version of what my Centralia would be or what would my show be? Yeah. And so I, I wanted to, you know, I think the, the shows, it needs to have a hook. It needs to have a theme. So I created this show called The Awakenings. And it was, it's built on the idea of using uh, more larger thematics. And I think uh, being in dream state while you're on stage for an hour sort of gives you latitude to do a lot of weird things that you don't necessarily have to justify because uh -huh. you're in a dream state. So I have a guest I do, right now I'm doing a rotating cast every time. I haven't stuck with the same cast. But we do an hour, and I'll always have one person play the Sandman or the Sand Person, Keeper of Dreams. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, like the last show I did, uh, I had a wonderful comedian, Gary DeNoya, and he had a Havsy, and he had roller skates on. And he was roller skating around the room while he was telling people their, their naughty dreams that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And this is as they're coming in to see the show. So it kind of lets you know you're in for a weird show yeah, yeah. to begin with. And then I'll have a piano player, some musicians, um, and then we just do it. And at the end of it, what we try to do is hopefully have disparate dreams and then you kind of come back at the end and you pull it together. Um, but it all kind of started with one of the times I was doing that Centralia with Chris Griggs show. Uh -huh. I, out of all the times I've done improv, that was the one standing ovation I've ever gotten. Wow. And, and that's what got me fascinated in that form because nobody gets standing, not legit, not like a, a legit standing ovation in an improv show. Maybe if you're doing whose line is it anyway or something like that. But I mean, in long form over short form. Mm -hmm. And I knew we were going to get a standing ovation. Like, so even like five minutes, 10 minutes before it, we had a blackout. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, we're going to get a standing ovation. And it was just three of us on stage. So I don't know. That's kind of me chasing the dragon. A little bit. So uh -huh. I, I'm doing that show again in August. Cool. Um, so if you find me on my socials and all that, or you can go to the pit-nyc.com, it'll be up. It's up now. But yeah, it's going to be up in August. I like to do it as a big event show every few months. That's very cool. And and when I text the the one that uh, that uh, the last one I did that. I, I hadn't seen like a form of improv like that. I've seen like the short for anyone who's listening, like short form improv would be like your whose line is it anyway, improv games kind of stuff, stuff that I did at like theater camp in in high school. And then once you get into long form, most people I feel like are familiar with the Herald where you have that kind of like one suggestion and then a whole a, like a basically a scenes uh, evolve from that. And then the other thing I've, the other kind of form that I was interested in is from uh, the movie Don't Think Twice, speaking of Mike Birbiglia, where you yeah. take the, has anyone had a particularly hard day? And I don't know if that form has a name, if that's a herald or something, but the idea of basically creating a, uh, a dream for your, the audience, the way dreams kind of free flow and shift is very cool to me. I like it. You know, I, I, my, my hope is that eventually I can do it in a way and find the right group of people and package it in a way to where it has legs. Um, yeah. Which is always the thing. I mean, the one thing I love improv, I really, really love it. I think it's a great humanitarian art form. It bums me out that I'm, it should mean more. I mean, and I mean me more in the industry standpoint, I guess. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, and nowadays it's going to be incumbent on me to figure out a way to package it. But there is a little bit, you know, it's kind of funny. 
is it because you know we've been talking about success or how that looks you know even with the show between awesome and disaster people ask me now it's sort of that well what should you do for your career and i'm like i need to be the reoccurring csi on some show and i would be a headliner tomorrow and i would be able to do all these things tomorrow because i've already put in my hours to be able to do these things at a ridiculous level i mean even now if for some reason if it mattered uh, if someone goes, oh, well, we've got to get the top 25 improvisers in New York, I'm going to be in the conversation. That doesn't mean I'm going to get it, but I feel pretty comfortable that I'm at that level. But it doesn't really mean anything. Like it's a soft skill that if I'm doing an audition, cool. Or, mm -hmm. you know, like I've got a horror film that's about to come out where most of I'm playing the small town sheriff and most of my stuff that they used is improvised. So it yeah. definitely has value, but I wish it had more of a concrete value in the way that other things have concrete value. Well, stand up. Well, yeah. stand up doesn't even have a concrete value to be honest like it used to, but it has more yeah. of a concrete value than improv. Yeah, well yeah, like it's thought like thinking of improv as like an art form as opposed to like a tool. Uh, yes. Is I I I agree with you and um I feel like um as uh, I, I feel, like, and, and maybe these things come in waves, but I, I, I know what you're saying because it's a great, people like when you can do it, but it's not, it, it's sort of like jazz. Like people used to go out and say, say oh, let's go to the, a jazz club or let's go see jazz very often. And then I feel like that uh, fewer people are saying that. Um, yeah. So we really need something or s someone, some kind of like, captivating force whether it's uh, a show or a person with like that's going to really be sort of like the kind of floodgates are open for bringing in a lot of new people into uh into improv and then i think that's will help it with the art form and maybe and maybe this is it because i think what you're doing chris is kind of very new and and different and maybe Maybe it's not the third lead on on a on a crime procedural, but it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to to me, Chris. Well, we'll see. I'm really happy that Middle Stitch and Schwartz got a season on Netflix because that helps. You know, everybody follows the money, so that's cool. And you got guys like TJ and Dave that sell out theaters doing two person improvisation. So, and you know, and obviously, uh, Freestyle Love Supreme's got a big Broadway show that's been that was doing great, and they're they're creating their own empire. Um, but you know, but like that, I mean, but Freestyle Love Supreme had Lynn Manuel, so that also helped them. But it's a, it's still an amazing deal. So hopefully, we'll have a resurgence. You know, I mean, Second City's coming back to New York, Upright Citizens Brigade is coming back to New York, and and hopefully we'll we'll have another boom. Totally, and the pit is continuing to to go strong. Um, it's going to be exciting, Chris. There's a, a bright light on the horizon. Uh, anything we can plug before we get out here? Uh, well, I, I'm on a 50, I have a 15 year improv group called the Baldwins. We're the uh, Pitts residency team. We're the first Saturday of every month at 7:30, and you can go to my website, chrisgriggscomedy.com, and you can find all my social media. I throw all my shows and stuff up on social media um, to do that. Uh, when does this air? Uh, in a, probably in a, in a couple of weeks, but I can get it out for something specific. No, that's all right. I, I think the Baldwins are probably a good safe bet. And then just go, my Instagram is at Chris Grace comedy. And I throw all my stand up shows up on there as well. And just come check me out sometime. Let's be social media buds. Um, I also have a, well, I was just talking about this horror film. I'm, I'm, uh, in a horror film called Killington that thank God po uh, wrapped post-production before the strike stuff. Right. And, uh, hopefully it, it'll be out and about. We're definitely going to be either doing the festival tour or trying to find distribution for that. And so we'll look for that as well. Very cool, Chris. Uh, glad to see you're still doing cool things. Uh, I aspire to continue to go th do cool things like you. So thank you again for, uh, for doing this. It was uh, really great to chat with you. It was great. I appreciate you having me on. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Chris Griggs, uh, an insightful guy, an insightful teacher, and someone who has a wealth of experience uh, from a lot of years in uh, the trenches here uh, in New York City, doing comedy and entertaining people, and someone who uh, I, asp I aspire 
to have that long of a, a track record in, in this city's art scene. Um, that's my, my hope. And I'm going to keep sticking to it because that is what I want. That is my slice of happiness. And I going to keep having nibbles at it continuously. So that's our show for today, everyone. If you enjoyed this and think you know a friend who would be interested in listening to this podcast, I have over 320 episodes available to you wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple. We are on Spotify. If you want to subscribe, share some episode links to please our algorithmic overlords, I would sincerely appreciate it. Another reminder, folks, Stitcher will be going away on August 29th. So you want to make sure that you export your shows and follow us on a different app before that date happens. Uh, You can go to stitcher.com for all of the details of how you can export your show list. But you want to make sure that you follow us on another app before August 29th. And uh, if you need a link to the show, you can find all of our links at awesomedisaster.com. You can follow me on Twitter at comicwillcarry, at willcarry23 on Instagram and on threads. And uh, I'm also at Comic Cool Carry on TikTok and whatever the next thing is going to be. That's what uh, I'll be on that as well. And you can find it at awesomedisaster.com. If you want to go and support the show a little bit further, we are on uh, Patreon as well as uh, we have a merch store. Uh, so you can sign up for Patre- our Patreon as well. As our, and by our, I mean me. Uh, it's just me right now. Uh, you can sign up for the Patreon and uh, check out the merch store also at awesomedisaster.com. want to also give a shout out again to my uh, artist of a lot of the artwork at awesomedisaster.com. Uh, Mateos and Sweet, congratulations on the birth of your child. I c- hope that you're both very happy and healthy and everyone is doing well. So thank you all again so much for being here. Continue to uh, be a part of that soft hustle, as I say, and uh, find, uh, find your joy And uh, I will see you next time between awesome and disaster. Stay safe, get vaccine boosted, and stomp out fascism. Take care, everybody.